I want the future to be at least as good as the recent past, uh, and yet things look much more ominous now than at any time since the early 1940s, and I don't think we're going to fix it um, by surrender, uh, whether it's economic surrender, uh, whether it's military surrender. Surrender is not the way. Um, a, a decent and self-confident approach is, is going to be best for everyone. Hello, everyone watching and listening. Today, I'm speaking with Australian journalist and former Prime Minister, the Honourable Tony Abbott. We met before once in Australia, and, and this will be a follow-up to that. We discuss Australia's role on the world stage, the problems facing the Australian economy and culture, the broader problems that face the West, how the quasi-cult of carbon threatens, in particular, the poor in the developing world, why new religions propagate where traditional faith has been abdicated, and the looming threat of war as China destabilizes and Putin pushes forward against Ukraine. We also discuss our joint involvement in the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, the ARC, which is a new venture um, grounded in London, designed to put forward a positive vision of the future that everyone could, in principle, be on board with voluntarily. So, Mr. Abbott, let's start by talking about Australia as a whole. I mean, what role do you think Australia plays on the international front now? Like, how, how do you think Australia should be conceptualized by people outside of the country? Well, Jordan, I think Australia is one of those wonderful countries which is big enough to be interesting and significant but not so big as to be intimidating and threatening. And Australia's history is such that there's really no one anywhere in the world who has a grievance against us. Um, and that's not true of so many other countries. Uh, you think of the United States, you think of Britain, you think of France, you think of Germany, you think of Italy, you think of Russia, you think of China. There are grievances uh, that different countries have against all of those countries. They're, all of those countries have great strengths as well. But um, Australia is one of those happy places uh, which has been a welcoming home to migrants from all over the world. Uh, yes, we fought on Britain's side in two world wars and we have fought as America's ally in just about every uh, conflict over the last hundred years that America's been in. And yet we've managed to do that uh, while retaining, I think, our global reputation as a, a country which is free, which is fair, and which wants to be a good mate uh, to the people and the countries of the world wherever we can. So that, at least in principle, lays open the option for countries like Australia. And I suppose this was true of Canada for a good while too, although I don't know if it is any longer to play a role in, what would you say, being a good faith partner in brokering peace, for example. And so, um, what problems do you think Australia faces at the moment? What and what and how 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 are the issues that are broadly besetting the West, say on the cultural war front, making themselves manifest in Australia? Well, the problems that every country has all the time <clears throat> are essentially how do we maintain our prosperity? How do we maintain our security? Um, and just at the moment, uh, this is perhaps a little bit more acute than usual. Uh, we've got uh, all of the challenges which um, all of the Western countries currently face. Uh, we've got uh, the risk of recession. We've got uh, high-ish inflation. We've got all of the supply chain issues which arose from the pandemic, and then the conflict in Ukraine, then the degree of decoupling with China. So we've got all of those issues. We've got uh, a particular problem with energy. While we are abundantly blessed, Jordan, with, uh, with coal, with gas, with uranium, 
Uh, we don't have all that much oil, but uh, because of the emissions obsession, uh, we are not using these blessings sufficiently to our own advantage. So that's a particular problem that we've got. We're exporting our coal and our gas uh, to the countries that are still only too eager to get it, but we're not readily using it as much as we should here. And then, of course, uh, being in the um, Asia-Pacific region, obviously uh, we're very conscious of China, um, in particular uh, China under the Communist Party and the challenges that that poses. Um, I keep saying that uh, the disruption that has been caused globally by the Russian attack on Ukraine is small beer compared to the disruption that would be caused globally by any attack uh, from the Beijing regime on Taiwan, given its much greater significance in the world economy and given the uh, effective security guarantees that the United States has always given to Taiwan. So, so look, um, th those constant challenges of security and prosperity are particularly acute right now. Uh, you ask uh, about the cultural issues which are afflicting the West. Uh, we may be maybe five years behind America, maybe three years behind the United States, uh, uh, the United Kingdom, but we have them here too, Jordan. Um, our universities are, uh, are, are more into brainwashing <laughs> than uh, the best that's been thought and said. Uh, our schools, um, they're nice places in the sense that they want to teach our kids uh, to be nice to each other, but I'm not sure that there's that much rigorous learning going on or as much as it should. All right, so let's let's dive in. We, we, we outlined a number of potential issues there of, of concern. Let's dive in first to what you described as the emissions obsession. And so this is something that Australia and Canada share uh, particularly. Um, Canada is blessed on the fossil fuel front and we have vast uh, reserves of uranium as well. And we are doing everything we can at the federal level in Canada to scuttle the oil and gas industry in, in favor, hypothetically, of renewables, which is a really bad idea in, in a country like Canada, which is massive and completely inhos inhospitable to human life. And in Australia, you guys have the same issues in many ways, ambivalence about utilizing your natural resources but strangely enough, very little compunction in sending them to China, coal in particular. And this strikes me as extremely peculiar, given that the Chinese, as far as I know, breathe the same atmosphere we do. And if the Chinese are building coal-fired plants like madmen, which they clearly are, then what difference does it make to us in the West, let's say, except in terms of prosperity, whether or not we use our technology to produce relatively clear, clean say, coal-fired plants, or the Chinese do it in China. Like, what in the world is the possible rationale for that, as far as you're concerned? Well, Jordan, I find it as mysterious as you do. Uh, we are uh, inflicting gratuitous economic damage on ourselves without doing any good uh, to the global environment uh, by refusing to use coal and gas in this country while exporting as much coal and gas as we can sell uh, to others, particularly China. And the interesting thing is that uh, while we are fastidious in measuring and reducing our emissions, uh, we are fastidious in making commitments uh, to the wider world that we are determined to keep, um, we're oblivious to the fact that emissions are going up and up because uh, Russia, China, and India, for understandable enough reasons, are making no such commitments. So, so this is really an act of economic self-harm that we are engaged in. It's a kind of um, virtue signaling on a national scale, and uh, I very much regret it. Um, I regard myself as a, as a, as a conservationist. Uh, I, I accept that we only have one planet. I accept that uh, if you look back over um, uh, what we know to have been the history of the planet. Uh, there certainly has been 
global warming, there has been global cooling, there have been hotter times, there have been colder times. So climate change is real in that sense, although you can argue about the contribution that uh, mankind's carbon dioxide makes to it. But um, certainly the efforts that we in this country are making uh, to reduce emissions are harming us and they're not actually making any difference to global emissions. And I just think that's uh, pretty irrational. Well, it seems to me that you could make a case that not only are they no, doing no good on the global emissions front, that in places like Germany, these idiot green policies have actually made the emissions situation worse. And so, you know, one way you could conceptualize this that sort of cuts across the political argument problem is that if the green policies that have been implemented by countries like Germany fulfilled their own mandate, at minimum, you could say that they have some credibility. So, you know, you could look at Germany and you could think, well, electricity is more expensive and it's more unreliable and the Germans are dependent on the Russians and, and other relatively autocratic states to provide their energy, but at least carbon emissions have gone down. But in fact, in Germany, partly because they've had to turn to burning lignite and they shut their nuclear plants down, which was an act of unconscionable stupidity, they're actually producing, I think it's 10 times as many emissions per unit of electricity as France, and far more, and they're far more polluting on the energy front than they were like seven years ago. So not only have they failed utterly on the economic front, they're actually doing worse by their own criteria. And the same thing has to be true of countries like Canada and Australia. When you look at it globally, if we export our resources to China and they do a relatively bad job of generating electricity, especially given the immense corruption in countries like that, why in the world wouldn't we do that in the West where we could do it, you know, with a certain degree of, let's call it finesse. And so... Uh, it, I cannot see that there's something wrong with my reasoning when I walk through the problem in, in that sense. And so, do, what do you think about that? Is, is, is there something that I'm missing, say, in relationship to Germany, or is this as foolish as it appears to be? Well, Jordan, I think this is monumental folly. I think it is self-destructive folly. But I think what we are dealing with here is something more akin to a new religion uh, than ordinary um, considerations of rational self-interest and um, even ordinary stock standard idealism. Uh, as I said, I'm all in favour of doing what we can to protect the planet, but I'm not in favour of doing things which harm us and don't help the planet. And plainly, that's what's going on right now. One of the many reasons why I think there's a religious dimension to all of this, uh, a kind of a, uh, almost like a cultish dimension to all of this, is that the same people who are most insistent on the urgency of emissions reduction are normally deeply hostile to the only form of emissions-free 24-7 uh, baseload power, namely nuclear. Now, if it really is absolutely essential that we move rapidly to a zero emissions world, and if we do want at the same time to maintain our standards of living, there's really only one way to go, and that's nuclear, which is proven, reliable, safe. Um, it may well be somewhat more expensive uh, at this time than alternatives, uh, certainly than uh, coal and gas and oil, uh, but we know it works and we know it's emissions free. Uh, we know that France has been generating something like 70% of its electricity from nuclear uh, for the best part of 40 or 50 years. They haven't had any significant accidents, so why not do something like this uh, in other countries uh, if we really do think <laughs> that uh, that emissions are as important as all that? The, the, the religious cult idea, so I, I think I want to pick up two streams of thought there. I'm also puzzled, like you, with regard to attempting to conceptualize the opposition to nuclear power. Because the, the bitter pill we're asked to swallow constantly is that climate change in the 
caused by excessive carbon dioxide production poses an existential threat to mankind. And so that's the ultimate shibboleth, let's say, with regard to the radicals on the left or people who are utilizing radical left ideas for their own nefarious purposes, let's say. And if that is the case, then, and we're willing to con contemplate uh, tactics like geoengineering, because I know B the Biden administration, for example, is toying with the idea of blotting out the sun like Mr. Burns in The Simpsons. And if we're willing to go to that extreme, or even to look into going to that extreme, then why in the world wouldn't we turn to nuclear? And the answer has to be, as far as I can tell, tell and tell me if what you think about this, is that there's actually an anti-industrialism and an anti-humanism at the basis of the climate apocalypse claims. And so the anti-humanism is something, it's often expressed in the form of the claim that there are too many people on the planet, you know, and that we could only, and you hear more extreme versions of this uh, where the claim is, well, we could really only um, tolerate in an ecologically sustainable manner a population of about 500 million, which is a big problem given that there's 8 billion people and we'd have to figure out what to do with all those excess bodies. And that even if we did have 500 million, those people would have to live, you know, basically at a subsistence level so that we wouldn't be scraping the surface of the planet to, with too much diligence, okay? And so th I have a lot of problems with that standpoint, not least because there's an element of it that's genocidal. And then there's a kind of naive Rousseauian anti-industrialism that seems to go along with that, which is part and parcel of the claim that all human activity is somehow pathological and that we're violating some essential state of nature. And then that all that mess, because that's a mess, also is allied with something that I think is even darker, which is this attempt by the hypothetically a-religious radicals on the environmental front to reduce the entire panoply of human problems to one issue, and that's of carbon dioxide, and then to claim for themselves an elevated moral virtue that goes along with, well, opposing carbon dioxide at all costs. And so to me, that's, you know, one of the commandments is that you're not to use the Lord's name in vain. And that commandment means that you shouldn't claim divine virtue or even moral virtue when you're actually acting in a manner that's only benefiting yourself. And I see that as the cardinal sin of this new religion, which is all morality can be reduced to the claim that I'm a good person because I oppose carbon dioxide and to hell with the cost. And I'll add one more thing to that, which, and, which is that from what I've been able to understand, if you can help the world's poor raise their average income on the GDP uh, with GDP as a measurement to about $5,000 a year, which pops them out of basic subsistence, then they start to be able to take a longer term view of their future and their children's future and to attend to environmental issues spontaneously. So my sense is th that we could, we could have a planet that was full of thriving people with a large population if people were rich enough, and that would mean that they would have to have access to cheap energy. And if we did that globally, then everyone would spontaneously start to evince concern for the environment. So we could have like a flourishing population and a planet that works. And so what the hell's wrong with that? Why isn't that a good plan? Well, well, well not, nothing's wrong with that, Jordan. Uh, it's a very sensible plan. And if you want to look at environmental devastation, uh, the places where you will find environmental devastation are the poorer countries uh, where they can't look after their forests, they can't look after their paddocks and fields, uh, where they can't afford to worry about the conservation of native animals. Um, it's really only the better off countries where we can take all these things seriously because in the other countries, they're embarked in a constant struggle just to stay alive. And uh, this is why, as you say, if if we want a better environment and if over time we want uh, the world's population to stabilise and perhaps even re reduce a little, um, if you look at what has already happened 
in many of the more developed countries, let's do what we can uh, through um, trade and through the encouragement of better governance, let's do what we can uh, through the encouragement of decent education and, 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 and the liberation of minorities, let's do what we can to try to bring uh, what are currently the most impoverished countries up to, as you say, a better level of life. Um, I mean, uh, you're right. Once a country gets up to about five thousand US dollars uh, per person per year in in national income, um, things start to transform. And uh, if you look at some of the countries of Africa, which have got to this level, uh, they are very, very different countries in in a host of ways uh, to what they were just a couple of decades back. The October 15th tax deadline has just passed. I know many of you might be dreading the stress of filing your taxes. Filing your taxes can be a long, excruciating process, but if you fail to file, you'll start to pile penalties on top of your tax debt. That's why you need to check out Tax Network USA. The team at Tax Network USA has a track record of success. They have reduced tax debts for numerous clients, totaling over $1 billion. Whether you're looking at a $10,000 or $1 million tax debt, they can help you with the settlement. It doesn't matter if you haven't filed in one year, five years, or even a whole decade. Tax Network USA is equipped to secure the best settlement for you. The expert attorneys and tax professionals at Tax Network USA can help resolve all tax cases no matter how they started. Don't let tax debt control your life any longer. Take the first step toward resolving your tax issues by visiting taxnetworkusa.com slash Peterson. That's taxnetworkusa.com slash Peterson today. Right. Well, I know that you have recently agreed to participate in this uh, Alliance for Responsible Citizenship conference and movement that we're organizing in, in London in in October, and I mean, part of our vision on the energy and environment front, well, it's it's two-dimensional. The first proposition is, stemming off of what we've already discussed, is that we don't have the moral right to sacrifice the world's poor, either in the West or in the developing world, to our, to our narrow green agenda, especially because it's not going to work anyways, and it puts all these people at risk. And so you see this, this very strange conundrum, right? Because the left, in principle, historically, has been the voice of the oppressed and the working class, and a particularly, let's say, strong voice for the poor. But when you see now what's happening, that, that the, the radical environmentalist types in particular seem to be willing to sacrifice the world's poor at the drop of a hat— to not make any progress whatsoever on the planetary salvation front, right? Like I said, it would be different if they could point to any, what, successes whatsoever on the alternate energy front that have actually produced a positive outcome. Instead, you see Germany, you see the UK, where energy prices are much more expensive than they were before and much more unreliable. So how do you understand, and this is maybe where we could start touching on issues uh, broader issues of faith. You know, you characterized this anti-industrial environmentalist movement as a religious enterprise. It's like, how do you, and you are, you know, you've been involved in the political game for a long time. How do you understand the fact that these policies have, st have started to become dogmatic doctrine and that they're being pushed so hard, you know, across the political spectrum, the Tories in the UK are worse on the net zero front than the lefties, or at least as bad. So how do you understand how this happened, given it's, that it's so preposterous? Well, that's a very good question, Jordan. And let me just give you one little anecdote, which I think might be telling. Um, the other week in London, I went to the famous Farm Street Jesuit Church. Uh, we got to the prayers of the faithful, and one of the prayers of the faithful was about the rapid decarbonisation of our society. Now, I don't normally stand up in church and object, and I wasn't going to break the habit of a lifetime on this particular day, but I did suddenly decide, well, bugger it. Uh, I went online, uh, found the parish website, and uh, sent a note uh, to uh, whoever was uh, the parish recipient of this thing saying, why the hell uh, are you doing this? 
The other day, a Father Dominic uh, sent a response to me uh, saying that uh, we have a, a, a moral obligation to reduce our emissions as quickly as possible, to which I said, well, sure, but don't we also have a moral obligation to try to ensure that pe poor people in rich countries and, and poor countries more generally have access to the affordable energy that they need in order to have a decent life. Now, I don't expect to get a response from Father Dominic or anyone else uh, from the Farm Street Jesuit Church, but I do think that what we're seeing here is uh, one of the many byproducts of the decline of what I would regard as a more substantial faith, uh, because we human beings tend to be um, uh, uh, creatures of faith, maybe it's because we need faith, uh, maybe it's because there's just something out there drawing us to faith. Um, if, if, if we don't have faith in our countries, if we don't have faith in our God, if we don't have faith in the religions that have stood the test of time, we'll find new things to have faith in. And even uh, in the heart of Catholicism, uh, we now have this green thing, uh, which I think is um, strange, unsettling, uh, fundamentally foreign, uh, and it can lead nowhere good. So I've been thinking about this issue of needing faith for a very long time, you know, and the, the classic objection of the rationalist materialists, I'd say the atheist rationalist materialists, is that you shouldn't have faith in anything for which there isn't proof. And, you know, there's a certain amount of, you can give a certain amount of credence to that viewpoint because it helps protect you against believing evidently counterproductive and foolish things. But I think the idea that you can't have faith or that you don't have to have faith in anything that isn't factual is misguided. And here's why. So. Tell me what you think about this. Well, the problem with human beings or a problem with human beings is that we're fundamentally bounded by our ignorance. And so, for example, if you embark on a marriage, you have to take a vow. And in principle, it's an unbreakable vow. And the reason you do that is because you have to jump with both feet with your partner into a kind of abyss. And the reason you have to do that is because, well, what the hell do you know? You don't know what's going to happen to you in your life. And so you take this person and you say, as a show of good faith, we're going to bind ourselves together, predicated on the assumption that we'll be able to handle what comes at us better as a honestly communicating and loving couple than we could do with sequential relationships or alone. Now, we don't know if that's true, but we're going to spend our whole life giving it our best shot. Okay, well, that's an act of faith because you don't have the evidence for what's going to happen in your life in front of you. Right, okay. You do the same thing when you take a new job, right? Whenever you make an important foray, you have to say, I believe this could work if I abide by this particular set of principles, and that's an act of faith. Okay, so that's ineradicable. Then, you know, you said there's something drawing us to faith. And so this is how it looks as far as I can tell. Is that First of all, some things have to be more important than others. Because if they're not, you can't do anything. And the reason for that is that if you're going to do something, you have to do that thing instead of all the other things you might have done or instead of nothing. So you have to prioritize. And as soon as you prioritize you have a hierarchy of value. And that means that if your hierarchy of value is internally consistent, there has to be something at the top of it. Now, the, the classic Judeo-Christian answer to that conundrum was that something like truth and love, the spirit of truth and love, should be at the pinnacle. And that should be expressed in honest discourse, for example. That's part of the worship of the word. And and now, if nothing is put at the top, then, well, then there's nothing at the top, and you have disunity and confusion. And so, there's, there's no, there, the only alternative to organizing your perceptions and your actions 
in a hierarchical manner with something at the top is confusion and disunity. There's no third choice. So I think that's what draws us to faith, is that we're drawn to integrate our perceptions and our actions under a single scheme. And that helps stabilize us psychologically, because then we're not confused and hopeless, but it also unites us socially. Because, you know, you and I, for example, right now, we can sit and engage in civil discourse because we've agreed on a unifying framework, right? We're going to talk for 90 minutes. We're not going to play any tricks on each other. And we're going to see how that goes. And that means now we can cooperate and compete in a peaceful manner. Okay, so I don't see any of, I don't see that any of that is replaceable. Now, you know, you pointed out that if we don't have faith in one thing, we're either going to have faith in nothing or in something else. And I, it does seem to me to be the case that, you know, Gaia, the Earth Mother, has risen up as an alternative to, let's say, Yahweh and the, and the classic, and the classic uniting God of the West. And that doesn't seem to me to be a reasonable replacement. Well, I, I agree with you, Jordan. And look, uh, the things that really matter uh, can't be proven. Certainly they can't be proven in the way that a mathematical formula uh, or some scientific experiment uh, can, be, can be proven. Um, we can't prove uh, that the people close to us really love us. Uh, they can't prove that they are really loved by us. Uh, we have to take all this stuff on trust. And uh, similarly, we absolutely need uh, an important purpose to our lives, which is above simple survival, simple pleasure, uh, uh, just the basic satisfactions that um, an animal might seek. Uh, we need to have a purpose, uh, and whether the purpose is looking after our loved ones, whether the purpose is being very good at a, at a necessary but quite possibly simple job, that we do as well as we can, whether the purpose is uh, is love and respect for uh, the God that we think is our creator. Uh, every single human being to live well needs a sense of purpose to his or her life. Um, once upon a time, it was, I suppose, civic mindedness. Um, in the case of some, it was family commitment in the case of others. It was a sense of the divine in the, in the case of still more. But all of those things are much weaker today across the West than they were a generation or two back. But because we are faith-focused people, we will seek other things. And it might be money, it might be pleasure, uh, hedonism in all its forms, or uh, we might find some alternative, um, a kind of green cult, if you like, or a climate cult, if you like, um, saving the planet not from the devil, uh, but saving the planet from a climate apocalypse that might fill that gap. Um, now, again, I say, uh, I think all sensible people should uh, be conservation-minded. Uh, I don't want to see um, beautiful buildings demolished uh, readily. I do not want to see uh, our flora and fauna devastated. I take infinite satisfaction and delight uh, in the waves rolling in uh, at Manly Beach uh, when I get down there of a morning uh, on my longboard. I love to see the dolphins uh, in the distance and occasionally the spout of a whale. Magnificent, absolutely magnificent. But um, you can't worship that. Uh, and certainly this idea that we should uh, fixate on man's contribution to carbon dioxide emissions, I, I just think is, uh, is odd. All right, so let's, let's walk through this a little bit more conceptually. So, so about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, psychologists started to analyze the manner in which the way people describe themselves aggregates. And they were looking at the underlying statistical structure of self-descriptive language. So here was the idea. We're going to study personality. Personality is reflected in language 
if we could analyze the statistical structure of language, we might be able to understand something more about personality. And so psychologists did this. They, they, they aggregated great bodies of descriptive phrases and sentences and adjectives and found out by statistical analysis, kind of an early application of AI, by the way, that temperament had five dimensions. Um, extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. Now, neuroticism is the is the dimension on which all the negative emotions aggregate. So if you're more sensitive to anxiety, you're more sensitive to pain and frustration and disappointment and guilt. And that's like a baseline sensitivity to life's challenges. And so the higher in neuroticism you are, the more units of physiological preparation you undertake per unit of stress, right? And it's kind of a guess. Okay, now, one of the things psychologists discovered at the same time was that all of the emotions associated with attention to the, to the narrow self were indistinguishable from negative emotion. So self-consciousness is actually a facet of neuroticism. And so to the degree that you focus on yourself, this is quite a stellar discovery, to the degree that you think about yourself, that you're concerned about yourself narrowly, you are simultaneously possessed by pain and anxiety. Right now, you kind of know that, eh? Because if you're out on stage and you're addressing a crowd and you get self-conscious, it's very uncomfortable. You blush, you lose your place, you stumble. The same thing happens to musicians if they're performing. And so self-consciousness is actually a disruption of the natural flow of events. Okay, now, when people are looking for something that unites them, let's say, and that calls to them, they tend to look for superordinate identities that are outside the self. So you could say, well, you could find meaning in an intimate relationship in with your family, with your local community, with your state, with your nation. And then maybe there's something upon which the integrity of nations itself rests. I think that's the word in the Judeo-Christian tradition, by the way. And so you nest your identity in these superordinate elements. And that's also an element of faith. And that takes you, well, the benefit on the hope side, you know, you said people have to have something to strive for. If you don't nest your identity in these superordinate social um, uh, organizations, then you end up impulsive and hedonistic and self-focused, and that makes you hopeless and miserable. Correct. So that seems to be a bad solution. Okay, okay. So, so all right, all right. So we're, we're in agreement on that. So, okay, so let me ask you something more specific then. You know, you are a very intelligent person. You had, you you won a Rhodes Scholarship. That's a very difficult thing to manage. You studied at, at Oxford. Um, and yet, and I'm saying this as devil's advocate, you're also, um, uh, you're, you're also a man of traditional faith. And so I might say, well, why, how is it that you have been able to balance your intellect, which tends, you know, the intellect tends to have this corrosive, rational, doubtful element that can demolish traditional faith, for example, which is certainly something that's happened to many people and happened more broadly culturally. Why did your faith remain for you a central element of your being? And how have you reconciled that intellectually? Well, <clears throat> this might sound a bit odd, Jordan, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, humility is incredibly important uh, to a successful life. Uh, I, I mean, you've got to, in a sense, uh, lose yourself to find yourself. You've got to, in a sense, forget yourself to fully flourish. And I, I guess uh, one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't have all the experience. Uh, I don't regard myself uh, as morally or intellectually superior to my, to my forefathers. And I might have personal doubts, but uh, I think it's important to be uh, sufficiently immersed in the tradition, uh, at, least to the, at least to the point where you respect it. 
uh, and you allow it to work its uh, its magic on you. And look, uh, uh, you know, my personal faith waxes and wanes. Uh, one of the many reasons why I never further pursued um, something that I did for a couple of years, uh, namely the Catholic priesthood, is because I didn't think I had enough uh, of a personal relationship uh, with uh, with our Lord and Master Jesus Christ to be able to communicate that uh, to, uh, to people and persuade people that they too uh, could have it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the fact that uh, my faith was insufficient to move mountains <laughs> doesn't mean that I don't respect it. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't strive after it. Uh, and it doesn't mean that uh, uh, such that I have uh, doesn't uh, sustain me. I mean... The Bible is the root of all wisdom, inspiration, and spiritual nourishment. The Hallow app empowers you to explore the Bible's profound teachings and to effortlessly incorporate them into your daily life. A great place to start while you deepen your understanding of the Bible is to check out Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year, available on the Hallow app for brief daily readings and reflections. Here you can dive into an extensive library of Bible reading plans, accompanied by insightful reflections and audio-guided meditations. Whether you're a seasoned Bible reader or just starting your journey, Hallow provides a platform for you to engage with Scripture like never before. Studying the Bible's literary brilliance has influenced countless writers, poets, and artists throughout history. By studying the Bible yourself, you'll gain a deeper appreciation for the power of storytelling, symbolism, and metaphor, enriching your understanding of literature across different genres. The Hallow app also helps you connect with a community of like-minded individuals, sharing experiences, insights, and encouragement along the path to spiritual growth. Download the app for free at hallow.com Jordan. You can set reminders and track your progress along the way. Enrich your education and nurture your mind and soul today. Download the Hallow app at hallow.com Jordan. That's hallow.com Jordan. Hallow.com slash Jordan for an exclusive three-month free trial of all 10,000 plus prayers and meditations. Okay, so you so you talked about the role of of moral and intellectual humility on that front. So okay, so so I've been reading, I've been writing about the book of Exodus, and I conducted a seminar with a variety of people on that book. I was reading this section the other day where the burning bush appears to Moses. And it's it's really a compelling section, eh? Because at that point, Moses is outside of Egypt. So he's no longer concerned with the tyranny or the Pharaoh or his strange heritage. He's gone off to this place called Midia. Midia is Midia? Midia? It, it, anyways, to a foreign country, it's Midia. He's out with the Midianites. He's married a woman there. He's taking care of his father-in-law's flocks. Uh, they respect him. He's got himself a life, you know, and it's kind of hassle-free. And he's wandering around near, near Mount Sinai, interestingly enough, when something attracts his attention, right? And he decides to turn away from his path and to go investigate. And so, to me, what that story is reflecting is the fact that in our lives, we'll be in a relatively comfortable position and something will beckon to us that we can decide to investigate. And if we decide to investigate that, we'll, well, God only knows what will happen. And that's what happens to Moses. He goes off the beaten path. He, he goes to investigate the burning bush. And the burning bush is a symbol of life and transformation at the same time, right? Because fire is a transformative element. So he goes to investigate being, that's life, and becoming, that's transformation. And as he investigates it more deeply, he finds that he starts to walk on sacred ground. And God tells him he has to take his shoes off. That's humility, right? And so, and then as he investigates even more deeply, the God of the Old Testament speaks to him and says that it's the same voice that called to Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. And so, this seems relevant to the issue of respect for tradition. And so, you could imagine, imagine that there's a spirit that unites the great acts of history, right? It's all a manifestation of the same proper orientation towards what's highest. That's represented in that story as the spirit of Yahweh, and that part of what you do 
if you're called upon to be a leader, which is, of course, the next thing that happens to Moses, is that you bow down and have respect to that guiding spiritual principle that's operated over the entire corpus of history. And so you seem to be making allusions to something like that when you said that for some reason you had a kind of intellectual or moral humility. Now, why did you have that given the fact that you could have been you could have been inordinately proud of your own intellect. I mean, it was of stellar quality, and you were definitely rewarded for it. So how do you think that humility developed, and why do you think people who are listening should give it some credence? Well, Jordan, uh, that wonderful story that you've just so well developed for us is one of the great civilizational stories uh, of our culture and of our history. And part of the modern tragedy is that we know so much and yet we know so little about the things that have really formed and shaped us uh, as, as peoples. And um, there's, there's almost an amnesia now about the Bible stories, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament. Uh, there's an indifference uh, to, uh, to the great history uh, whether it's uh, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the history of, of of the development of England and so on, and uh, and how the great ideas spread from uh, these places uh, throughout uh, much of the world. Um, there's just this uh, ignorance mixed with scorn, which I think is so sad. Uh, I mean, we can know all about artificial intelligence but if you don't know anything about the culture and the civilization which has made this possible, you are intellectually impoverished, however clever you might be in so many areas. Now, now, uh, this is this is uh, part of our part of our problem. Now, I, I guess I was blessed, if you like, uh, by um, this sense of respect verging on reverence uh, for our history. Uh, and for our traditions. When I was very young, uh, my uh, mother would probably on a weekly basis uh, bring me home the uh, now almost forgotten, but back in the 1960s and 70s, very well known Ladybird books, which popularised um, great historical stories, mostly from British history, I hasten to add. But, you know, there was Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar and... Uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle and all these as well in there. And I just soaked it all up. And so I guess from a very young age, uh, I, I, I wasn't scornful of these things. I was appreciative of these things. I wasn't rejecting of these things. I was respectful of these things. And I guess that's what's sustained me for better or for worse all the way through. All right. So, th so that's a very interesting observation. So you were exposed to biographical accounts of greatness when you were a kid, and, and those and, affected you. Now, I think, and, and I, think I was that's common, and I was right? lucky. I was lucky, Jordan, as a as a as a youngster. Um, I had nuns teaching me uh, when I was uh, in in infant school. I had uh, Jesuits who were presiding over my primary and secondary education. Uh, these were the days before. Uh, the Western Church had been afflicted uh, to the extent it ultimately was by, I guess, the religious self-doubt uh, that seems to have been associated with elements of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, these were impressive human beings. Um, whatever foibles and faults they may have had, they were impressive human beings. Uh, certainly, they immensely impressed and helped me uh, as a youngster, and I've been lucky to carry all that uh, throughout my life thus far. Uh, I have had wonderful exemplars uh, of of courage, of faith, of inspiration, of insight, and uh, that's brought me along, carried me in its wake, and my challenge is to be worthy of this great benefaction that I've had. Right, right, right. Well, you you also said that your mother brought you these stories, and that's kind of interesting psychologically and symbolically, because what that means in a sense is that your mother brought you tales of the great men of the past, which 
indicated that your mother, that, so the primary feminine influence in your life, was someone who believed that that greatness of spirit actually existed. Now, you could imagine the counterpart, right? Because you could have had a mother or female teachers who were bitterly resentful about the patriarchal oppression of the past, who believed that every heroic figure was nothing other than a patriarchal oppressor and that was anti-masculine in the most fundamental sense in that manner. Now, you know, you see this, there's lots of women, and this is increasingly true, and I think it's increasingly a consequence of familial breakdown. There's no shortage of women who have never had a positive relationship with anyone masculine in their whole life. You know, now I talked to this leftist scholar, Naomi Wolf, a while back on my podcast, you know, and and she's she wrote The Beauty Myth, and she's been a pretty uh, powerful voice on the left on the pro-patriarchal oppression front, right? I mean, that's a narrative she buys. But, you know, she was raped when she was 11. And then she had a pretty dismal experience with someone who was supposed to mentor her in university. And it left her fractured and with a permanent animus against men, you know? And, and, and you can see that sort of thing spiraling out of control. But your mother had respect for these historical figures what was the relationship between your mother and your father like on the personal front? Look, um, you know, I, I don't claim to have uh, uh, seen uh, um, every intimate moment, so to speak, but uh, my mum and dad had uh, a long and I think pretty successful marriage and they raised four kids who have turned out to be okay. Um, all of us respected our, well, my mum's still alive. Uh, uh, all of us respected our parents uh, very much and have done our best to, to honour them. But uh, uh, look, I, I absolutely accept, Jordan, that um, again, to use a phrase that the Jesuits used to use back in the day, uh, in a sense, we are all the product of those who have loved us or failed to love us. And I guess if if you've come from a from an affirming and supportive intellectually curious, um, capable family, you are more likely uh, to turn out with a certain set of attitudes than if the opposite has been the case. Uh, and, and yeah, I can fully understand why someone whose experience of, of others has been bitter, um, how they, they, they might be less um, optimistic and outgoing, but... Uh, if you believe, as I do, that most people most of the time are basically good, um, and if you think, as I do, uh, that the challenge is every day to try to come closer to being your best self, well, that's, uh, that's a good way to live your life because even if it's not perfect, at least you won't be consumed with bitterness. Yeah, well, that, that's something that can stop the tragedy from degenerating into hell. So that's at least a it's at least a doorstop uh, against the catastrophe of life. You know, I've I've thought that through a lot, partly as a consequence of working as a clinician. You know, I've uh, I've seen people in very dire situations, and it's certainly the case that if job-like tragedies come to visit you in life, you can make the situation a hell of a lot worse by becoming bitter and resentful. You know, and you could point to the catastrophes and say, look, I have every reason to be bitter and resentful. And the proper response to that is, well, be that as it may, and you could well be right. If you go down that road, tempted towards it by the weight of your suffering, all that will do is make your suffering much worse and universalize it. Yeah, uh, see, that's that's what the book of Job concentrates on so in such an interesting manner, eh? Because Job has absolutely every reason to lift his middle finger towards the sky and to curse God. I mean, God literally bets with Satan that Satan can't take Job out, you know, and that's that's a pretty rough situation, right? And But I think the moral of the story is something like, no matter what happens to you in your life, and this is a, this is a bitch of a thing to say, no, no matter what happens to you in your life, no matter how deep the degradation and the suffering, you are called upon 
to maintain faith in the essential goodness of being and to orient yourself upward. You know, right. and that's that's a hell of a thing to ask of people. But right. the alternative seems to be degeneration into a kind of hopeless and bitter misery. Exactly right. And and one of the books that I read as a youngster was Viktor Frankl's famous book, From Death Camp to Ex- Existentialism. Um, now, I didn't know too much, still don't know too much about the existentialism, but I do know uh, that he survived that uh, by virtue of uh, focusing on the love he had for his wife, um, the love he had for his family, um, because if you have a why, as he kept saying, you can bear any how. The tragedy is that the modern world, while having less and less in the way of objective difficulties, um, has less and less of the why that will enable us to endure the how. So you talked about humility as a precondition for your development of a certain kind of respect for the accomplishments of the past. And, you know, we we could also talk about, so, so one of the, one of what, something I've learned about the religious enterprise is that the emphasis on virtues like humility is allied with a sense that that has to be practiced. So the practice of faith in that regard is to actually practice, to, to, to consciously adopt an attitude, let's say, of humility. And humility might be, in principle, you know, I still have something to learn. I could learn to listen better. I could learn to attend better to the treasures of the past. I'm an ignorant creature. I should conduct myself in that manner. I should seek wisdom. And and there are all sorts of counterpositions that the full play of the rational mind can produce that will fight against that impulse, but it is something you can practice. And the same thing seems to apply to, let's say, an attitude of gratitude. Um, that, and, and this is also the part of the problem with the idea that of you, the fact that you of the, the idea that you could orient yourself by mere facts. Like, if you look at the conditions of life, especially when things are not going well for you, you could easily proclaim, like the antinatalists proclaim, that life is so bloody miserable in its essence that it would be better if it didn't exist at all. That's Mephistopheles, by the way, in Faust's, uh, in, in Goethe's Faust, right? Is the whole enterprise should just be scrapped because the suffering is just too much. Well, the alternative to that is to attempt to practice finding what's good, I suppose, even in the darkest spots. You know, like when my wife, a while back, my wife was afflicted with with what she had been told would be a terminal cancer. And in fact, the cancer that she had had only been reported by 200 people and every single one of them died within 10 months. So it was pretty damn dismal, you know? And I watched her nearly die daily for like nine months. It was rough. And then she had surgical complications that, you know, the surgery probably, it was certainly one of the factors that saved her life, but it also put her in great peril, you know? And she, what did she do to cope with that? Well, she turned to the things that she had in her life that were positive, right? She really opened herself up, for example, to the love of her children in a way that even though she had been a very good mother and had a very close relationship with her kids, she found a dimension of love, of of that maternal love that was fathomless, I would say. And that really helped her, you know? And she also decided when her father, her father had to cope with the long-term neurological degeneration of his wife. She had prefrontal dementia, and she deteriorated from the age of about 55 to about 70, you know, in the, in the way that neurological diseases take you out piece by piece. And he did that. He was stellar, man. He took care of her like a champ. And, like, he was a real man about town, but he, he just reoriented himself in a selfless manner that was something to behold. 
And he was also willing to accept help. And that's another thing that happened to Tammy when she was ill, is that she abandoned a lot of her pretensions and she allowed people into her life to support her. And that was also part of that practice of being grateful even, even under dreadful circumstances. And, and Jordan, this is where suffering is not ever something that we should go out and seek. But if suffering finds us, uh, if we if we react rightly to it, it, it is in its own way, or it can be at least in its own way, ennobling. And uh, I'm thinking of a of a good friend of mine whose wife uh, ultimately died of dementia. Um, for four or five years, um, she didn't know him, but he went every day, even so. Uh, and you could say, well, why did he bother? Well, just in case she did know, and because that was the duty of a husband for a wife in extremis. And we can say, well, let's try to, you know, baptize the suffering. Uh, let's try to make the most of this. Or we can say it's all too hard uh, and we can euthanize people. Um, we can institutionalize people and, and, I just think it's important that we choose the better way. Uh, as, as far as we humanly can, we should choose the better way. And again, uh, if we go back to the, to the teachings of, of Holy Mother Church, I mean, it's best if you get something out of the sacraments. But even if you don't, you should keep going uh, because you just never know. Um, and maybe even if you don't think you're getting anything out of it, uh, you might actually be getting something out of it, um, which uh, is is beyond your comprehension, but is nevertheless making a difference. Well, you know, when, when I was a kid, 13 or so, and starting to turn away from the Protestant church that my mother in particular was part of, we didn't have a particularly religious home, but she went to church every Sunday, and she liked to sing, and she liked the community, and I got pretty skeptical about probably about my emerging understanding of the conflict, hypothetical conflict between, say, evolutionary views of the origin of man and the views that were being put forth in the church and decided that it was appropriate for me ethically to stop going, uh, which caused my mother a certain amount of distress. Um, now, part of my cynicism at that time, I suppose, was the kind of standard petty observation of weekend, about the criticism of weekend Christians, right? People go to church for an hour a week and they proclaim their allegiance to this virtuous pathway and then they go back out into the world and do exactly what they were going to do anyways. And, you know, there's some truth to that, I suppose, in that everyone can be hypocritical, but that was also true of me. And I had an insufficient understanding of that at the time. But I would also say and this is to your point about what the practice might be doing for you, even if you don't understand it, is that, you know, even an hour badly spent contemplating your own inadequacies, let's say in the form of sin and trying to aim upward, seems to be an improvement over never doing it all at all for even a minute. And which is, seems to be the alternative, right? Because once you scrap the church, and this is the sort of thing that people like Richard Dawkins and the atheist types would have us do. We'll just dispense with all that. And his plan was that we'd all become enlightenment rationalists, but we tend to degenerate into polytheistic pagans instead. And then we don't even give a second thought to anything approximating a higher moral endeavor. And, and then these weird quasi-religions grip us and pull us down. Exactly right. Look, you know, I do not claim... Uh, to be a particularly virtuous person. Uh, and I certainly uh, do not put myself on any kind of a pedestal, uh, but I am confident, uh, not that faith makes us good, but that faith makes us better. And I am sure that I would be even worse, but for the fact that uh, I had uh, a wonderful early beginning, um, and even now, um, 
<laughs> pretty imperfectly, <laughs> I try to practice it all. So when you were when you were the leader of the opposition, that was 2009 to 2013, and then you were prime minister for two years. Now, you, you said that you didn't regard yourself as a sufficiently developed person on the moral front, let's say, to... Um, to enter the priesthood, you 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 studied as a Catholic seminarian, and so you you took the devil's route into politics. Let's say I saw the now, dark. You, yeah, you saw the dark. Okay, well, so so tell me about your experiences as the leader of the opposition and as prime minister. I mean, you got to see how things operated at the highest level, both nationally and internationally. And so, what did you learn about people and? What did you learn about the kind of machinations that go on at the highest political levels? And I'm I'm also curious about your experiences on the international front, like with organizations like the World Economic Forum and so forth. So what, what conclusions did you derive from this time that you spent so integrally involved in the political landscape? Well, um, I, I think the important thing is to say what you mean and do what you say. And it doesn't matter whether you're the local cobbler um, or the local school teacher uh, or um, a professor of law uh, or indeed the leader of a country. I just think you've got to say what you mean and do what you say. And there were some leaders that I interacted with who I thought were brilliant and capable, but I never really sensed that they were being fair dinkum with me. And there were others who uh, were probably less brilliant uh, uh, in some ways, but uh, I got the impression that they were being straight with me and um, always that's the test. Um, can you be straight with someone and do you think that person is being being straight with you? And um, And I guess knowing that the world is made up of all sorts of different people, um, some of whom will try to be helpful, some of whom will not try to be helpful. You've got to try to conduct yourself in such a way that the people whose welfare it is your duty to advance are as best as you can manage it, having their, their, their well-being advanced. So as opposition leader, it was my job to try to work out what the then government was doing wrong uh, and what I might do that would uh, make it less wrong or perhaps even more right. Uh, and then in government, it was my job to try to ensure that to the extent government can, it's it's making bad situations better, uh, making good situations better, knowing that um, you're never going to make it all right. Uh, there are some things which you probably can't even begin to improve. So you've got to know what's within the purview of government and what's not really. Uh, and, it, and it's a question, I suppose, of applying your insights and your judgment, um, hopefully, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, helped by such character as you've managed to develop over the years uh, in, in, in ways which make sense and make a difference. And Look, I can talk about different different policies, uh, but in the end, the job of everyone in public life is first to do no harm and then to try to respond intelligently to the, to the exigencies of the day, all the time hoping to nudge things in a better direction, uh, as best you can tell. Um, that's the duty of everyone in public life. How, how would you analyze the narrow and broader success of your attempts to play a straight game when you were prime minister? I mean, you're, you're, you, you ran into a lot of opposition, and, and, and your faith ran into a lot of opposition as well. And, you know, a cynic might look at your record and say, well, if you would have... Um, being a little more instrumental in your tactics, a little more Machiavellian, let's say, you might not have run into so much difficulty in opposition. I'm not necessarily saying that's the case. I'm asking, in retrospect, you know, you attempted to play a straight game. In some ways, I think you were a man out of time 
you know, you, you know what I mean, is that your the qualities that you brought to the position weren't necessarily the ones that were being demanded loudly and publicly at the time. You know, and your Catholicism, for example, is certainly something that exists in opposition to the new environmentalist ethos. Arguably so, at least. And so, so do, do you think that attempting to play a straight game worked for you? And if so, how? And do you think that politics tends to attract people who are more likely to play a crooked game than other modes of interacting with the world, business, art, culture? Well, Jordan, uh, I think it would be generally thought uh, or conceded that I was a, a very effective leader of the opposition in that I brought my side of politics back into government in record time. Um, now, I did that by, I suppose, uh, uh, ruthlessly focusing on the mistakes of the then government uh, and coming up with what I thought were uh, feasible and uh, principled and effective ways of, of, of improving that. Now, I got into government and it would generally be thought that I was less effective as a prime minister. And I guess the fact that my own party uh, replaced me after two years would, would provide a certain validation to that. But nevertheless, uh, I did my best to uh, try to temper the emissions obsession. Uh, I did my best to stop the border protection disaster and I think pretty much completely succeeded uh, in that. Uh, I did my best to uh, get taxes down, in fact, abolished a couple of taxes, uh, big taxes, the carbon tax and the mining tax, uh, did my best to reduce the regulatory burden, uh, did my best to honour and respect uh, the traditions and the institutions which had stood the test of time. Now, now because uh, I was probably um, against the zeitgeist uh, in a way that... Uh, most contemporary politicians are not, uh, I did attract a kind of visceral dislike, uh, including from people inside my own party who were happy enough uh, when I was a successful leader of the opposition uh, to uh, put up with this uh, uh, more traditional conservative approach to things, uh, but decided once we were in government uh, that they uh, they could do better. But look, it, it's just it's just one of those things. I mean, so why do you think why do you think you were so so like universally acclaimed as effective as leader of the opposition, and that that was then flipped on its head to some degree when you became prime minister when you became the prime minister itself? Right? It, it doesn't exactly stand to reason. So what do you think happened? Well, well Jordan, the leader of the opposition has effectively one job to get his team into government. Uh, the leader of a government has many jobs. Uh, you've got to try to ensure that everything which is the per in the purview of government is is handled as well as it can. So, so um, running a government is much harder than leading an opposition. Um, it is. And it's particularly difficult at the moment given that we are more fragmented and more polarised um, in the West than we have been for a long, long time. And I suppose, I, I think it was more difficult as a Conservative uh, because there's a sense in which uh, you're against the zeitgeist, you're out of sympathy with the temper of the times. But rather than conform yourself uh, to the so-called signs of the times, I think the important thing is to push on with what you think is right and do your best to be good enough uh, to overcome the uh, the difficulties of, of, of these times. And <clears throat> notwithstanding the fact that I was only there for two years, I think it was probably the most successful two years of the nine years of the recent coalition government in this country. So, you know, I talked to Bibi Netanyahu about issues that were similar to this. And he made himself dreadfully unpopular at one point in his political career by pursuing a round of radical uh, uh, measures aimed at transforming Israel economically. And as far as I can tell, those worked. 
but they took about 10 years to bear fruit, and he was sort of in the political wilderness that entire time. But he certainly came back with a vengeance. And so one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, are you pleased about the fact that you stuck to your guns? And if so, why, given the defeat on the electoral front? And also, what did you learn from, suffer from, and benefit from as a consequence of being attacked in the manner that you were? One of, one of the phrases I think I used on the night I was uh, ejected from the parliament, Jordan, is that it's better to be a fighter than a quitter. And uh, if you're not prepared to lose uh, uh, in a good cause, you're not really prepared to fight for a good cause. And, and, and so, look, uh, I'm, I'm pleased that um, I did try to resist the emissions obsession. Uh, I did try... Uh, to get the government uh, less burdensome on people's lives. Uh, I, I did try to ensure uh, that our country had a degree of uh, integrity in its borders. Uh, I did try to ensure that our country was, a, was, a, was an effective and valuable ally uh, to, uh, to our friends. And, uh, and look, uh, um, there are a few things that I guess uh, I might have done differently. Um, everyone makes mistakes, but uh, but fundamentally, I think what I was trying to do uh, was good and proper. Um, could I have been uh, more emollient from time to time with colleagues? Of course. Um, could I have lavished a little more time on some people? Sure. Um, might I have expressed myself for uh, better in different circumstances? Well, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I've done plenty of dodgy interviews over the years. <laughs> Who hasn't? Um, but, uh, but I think what, I think, I think the, the project, if you like, uh, the purpose, if you like, was, uh, was good and right, and I'd do it again in a heartbeat. What, and what made you prepared to lose, do you think? Well, um, in the in the end, uh, it's it's about trying to make a difference, and if you want to make a difference, you've got to strive for it, and if you're prepared to sacrifice that which you are striving for in order to win, it's not about the cause; it's about it's about you, and this is the problem in our public life right now. Uh, too many people seem to be uh, about uh, preferment, uh, promotion. Um, it's, it's about them. It's not about the country. Uh, it's not about the cause. Um, they would rather stay in office than make a difference. Yeah. It's a very narrow, it's a very narrow conception of self. Eh? I mean, one of the problems with... so. If you look at the life outcomes of psychopaths, and psychopaths are particularly interesting, eh? Because they're they're completely self-interested in this in the narrowly selfish sense. But one of the interesting things about psychopaths is they betray their future selves just as badly as they betray other people. So, like a psychopath will take momentary gratification whenever he can get it. And the problem with that is that there's always a price to be paid. And so Psychopaths are completely incapable of learning from experience, and they're much more likely to end up in prison. And the reason for that is that that impulsive, narrow focus on the demands of the self actually turns out to be a very, very bad medium to long-term strategy, even if you're thinking selfishly, right? Because you're not conceptualizing how you're going to be interacted with by people over any span of time. It's all about now, you know, and when we talk about the power monger types being selfish, it isn't just that they're selfish, it's that they're stupidly and narrowly selfish in a manner that can't sustain itself. Yeah. One of the things that I often used to say to myself was no unnecessary enemies. Now, <laughs> there are some necessary enemies because if you want to do something that you really believe is right for the country and others oppose it, they are going to be your enemies, and you just can't avoid that. But uh, but let's not 
gratuitously offend people because uh, we can. I mean, that's the mark of the bully. It's not the mark of someone who has at least tried to be a statesman. Yeah, yeah. Well, no unnecessary enemies. That's sort of like the doctrine of minimal necessary force. Oh, it's a good doctrine. Let's turn our attention, if you don't mind, um, to the international landscape. And so you have given a lot of thought, for example, to the issue of China. Um, I'm not a big fan of the CCP, not least because they support North Korea. And I would say that any state that supports North Korea is, let's call them questionable on the moral front, to say the least. And so, and you guys in Australia, you have to deal with China in a way that's even more um, immediate and threatening and promising than, 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 say, those of us who are a little bit more distant. And so, yeah. what do you see looming on the international front vis-a-vis -vis China? Their economy doesn't seem to be very stable. They seem to be degenerating into a very comprehensive surveillance state tyranny. The, our hope in the West that increasing material wealth would liberalize China doesn't seem to be bearing fruit although, you know, the Chinese aren't starving and there's something to be said for that. And we've had a lot of cheap goods as a consequence. So what, how, do you, how do you conceptualize China, the West's proper relationship with China? What, what are your views in that domain? Well, I think it was uh, the, uh, the current American Secretary of State, Blinken, uh, who said that we would uh, cooperate where we can and, uh, we will uh, compete where we should and confront where we must. I think that was the formula he used. And I actually thought that was quite a good uh, formula. Uh, in my time, uh, when uh, MH370 disappeared into the wastes of the Indian Ocean with uh, uh, 240 people on board, of whom about 150 were Chinese nationals, uh, uh, Australia put... Uh, everything we had into that search because that was the right thing to do. And I think the Chinese uh, government uh, appreciated that. By the same token, uh, when China declared uh, uh, unilaterally air defence identification zones over parts of the East and South China Seas, we flew military jets uh, through there, there because, um, again, that was the right thing to do. Uh, when China was trying to create this uh, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, against the wishes of both America and Japan, uh, our very good friends and allies, uh, we were prepared to join this, um, although we insisted on changes to the governance structure because we wanted it to reflect uh, the kind of governance structures that uh, global bodies typically had rather than being simply a proxy uh, for the communist government in Beijing. So, so look, I think in my time, we did pretty well. Uh, we successfully secured uh, the first free trade deal between China and a G20 country. But prior to 2015, I think it was still possible to be optimistic about China uh, and to think that even under the CCP, um, economic modernization was going ultimately to lead to a degree of political liberalization and that over the, the decades, uh, there would be some kind of, uh, of, of convergence, if you like. <laughs> Unfortunately, as we discovered in the COVID period, <laughs> if there was any convergence taking place, we were getting more like communist China than they were getting yeah, yeah. Like, the liberal, like the liberal West. Uh, so, so my, my attitude uh, to China and to the CCP, uh, I think, was uh, fair enough, over-optimistic perhaps, but it was fair enough back then. Uh, my, my view today is, is, is quite different. Um, China is increasingly oppressing its own citizens. Uh, it has uh, crushed the freedom of Hong Kong, one of the world's great cities, uh, it's um, being monstrous towards its Uyghur, its own Uyghur citizens. Um, it's bullying and threatening all its neighbours. And it's now particularly focused on, on taking Taiwan 
by force if necessary. Now, now I, I think that uh, if the Beijing regime believes that it will be 1.4 billion Chinese against 24 million Taiwanese, uh, at some point in the near future, they will strike. Um, and I just think it would be horrific for 24 million Taiwanese to have their lives surrendered into the hands of a brutal dictatorship. Um, uh, and while no one wants conflict, uh, I think it is important uh, for free countries like Australia uh, to join with our partners and allies, such as the United States, such as Japan, such as the United Kingdom, uh, to say very clearly to Beijing, um, there will be the most severe consequences if you try to alter the status quo by force uh, across the Taiwan Straits. Um, as I said earlier, Jordan, um, uh, the Ukraine war has been a catastrophe, uh, but it would be uh, any war uh, over Taiwan uh, would, would be several orders of magnitude greater. And I think we have to do everything we can to deter that. But I think uh, strength is much more likely to deter than weakness. And so you seem to be quite concerned about the probability of a Chinese assault on Taiwan. And so, you know, in my darker moments, I think, well, if I was running the CCP, um, a little distraction to take my citizens' attention away from the catastrophes on the domestic economic front might be quite welcome. There's nothing that unites a fractious population more than a targeted enemy. Um, it's a pretty easy thing to use propaganda to, to um, you know, to agitate for a vision of a unified China as it should be. And so it would be a lovely distraction. And so, and you said, you know, you, you take a peace through strength approach, let's say, and you talked a little bit, you, you made some allusion a little bit to um, deterring China. Like, what do you think that the West could do on the deterrence front that wouldn't uh, increase the probability of a cataclysmic interchange between the West and China? See, this, the terrifying thing about China is that they're likely more willing to sacrifice their citizens than we are. Right, and God only knows what they'd price they'd be willing to pay to, to invade Taiwan, for example, especially if that gave them a purchase on power for another five years. So that's a very hard enemy to deal with, right? Because if they'll light themselves on fire to singe you, they're, that's a pretty difficult thing to contend with. I, 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 t I take your point, Jordan, and uh, I take your point, and, I, and I, I particularly take your point that... Uh, uh, a dictatorship in trouble is a more unpredictable and dangerous dictatorship uh, than a dictatorship that thinks that its best days are ahead. Um, but likewise, uh, I don't think that free countries can be blasé about the fate of what is practically a free and independent country. Um, I don't think that... Uh, uh, the democracy should uh, depart from uh, the one China policy. Um, I don't think that the United States should change its uh, uh, strategic ambiguity as such, but I do think that uh, back channels um, and certain practical steps ought to be taken uh, to try to ensure that Beijing is under no illusions uh, about... Uh, about the magnitude of, of the challenge it would face. And uh, I'm not necessarily President Biden's greatest fan, but on this particular issue, um, his uh, statements repeated now, I think four times that the United States would defend Taiwan, uh, may well have sent a strong message to Beijing, even though when officials have subsequently walked them back, they have stressed that the uh, posture of strategic ambiguity has not changed. I mean, I think he has actually changed what strategic ambiguity means without abandoning the term. 
Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts, sir, on the on the situation vis-a-vis Russia and the Ukraine? Well, Jordan, I know look, that's a complicated topic. And it, well, look, um, again, I, I, I don't say this is easy, um, but I think what Putin is doing is monstrous. Um, I think it's monstrous. Um, he regards Ukraine as a rebel province, just as Beijing regards Taiwan as a rebel province. And um, unlike Taiwan, which has had a, a kind of a legally ambiguous uh, situation now for, for decades, Ukraine has been fully and legally independent uh, for 30 odd years. Um, Putin has never accepted that. Um, even though Ukraine was no threat to Russia, uh, even though NATO was no threat to Russia, uh, he sent his army across the border, uh, expecting a rapid uh, victory, uh, expecting that his death squads would find and eliminate uh, President Zelensky. Uh, the Ukrainians have turned out to be much more united, much more heroic, much better prepared, much more imaginative, much more creative on the battlefield. Uh, And so for the last 15 months, uh, they have at worst stalemated the Russians and in some ways bested the Russians, notwithstanding the fact that Russia has, has vastly more resources, vastly more manpower, vastly better weaponry. And um, I think it's the duty of, of free countries such as mine uh, to try to avoid escalating the war, sure, but also to try to do whatever we can to help the Ukrainians into the most advantageous possible position. In, if things went optimally, let's say, for the Ukrainians, and but realistically, optimally for the Ukrainians and for the West, how do you think, like, what do you conceptualize as an ending? You know, because one of the things I've really tried to puzzle out is, well, what's the end game here? Like, if we got what we wanted, and by we, I mean the West that's supporting Ukraine, if we got what we wanted, what would that look like? Do you, do you have a sense of that? Well, ideally, it would be... Um, Ukraine regaining every inch of its territory and driving every last Russian soldier off its land. Ideally, that would be what it looks like. Um, Now, in the end, I think it's up to the Ukrainians to decide uh, what they are prepared to accept. Um, But at the moment, uh, despite the fact that Putin is relentlessly and mercilessly uh, devastating their infrastructure, Uh, pulverizing their cities, uh, they are determined to fight. Uh, And the extraordinary thing is that this message that we got um, very, very uh, pervasively prior to uh, the 24th of February last year, that really uh, there were the Western Ukrainians uh, and then there were the sort of Russian Ukrainians, um, that appears to be largely a a Putin-inspired myth um, the Russian-speaking Ukrainians appear to have been almost as uh, appalled by uh, the brutality of the Russian invasion as everyone else. Um, and Putin has succeeded in uniting the country in a way that maybe no one else has. So, look, I think I think out of respect for the heroism of the Ukrainians, uh, we have to uh, leave them to determine what they think uh, is a satisfactory outcome. Um, Obviously, uh, we do not have to support, and I would not expect this for a second, um, any uh, official Ukrainian incursions into Russia. Uh, But I do think that NATO and NATO's partners such as Australia should first do everything we humanly can to help the Ukrainians uh, into the best possible position militarily, uh, B, um, say to uh, the Ukrainians that once this war is over, uh, of course we will admit you 
uh, into NATO uh, and see if there is any use of nuclear weapons uh, by the Russians, well, we will then immediately admit you to NATO. That would be, I think, uh, a reasonable position uh, for Ukraine's friends to adopt, which is trying to avoid escalation uh, while at the same time trying to avoid um, the triumph of aggression and dictatorship. So, all right, we're, we're coming to the end of our time on YouTube. Um, I know you have a hard out that we negotiated a priori, and so I won't ask you any more questions. I would, however, like to offer you the opportunity, if you think it's, it would be useful, to address anything that you think might be um, well communicated to people on whatever broad international level we manage with this podcast. Is there is there anything else that you'd like to say to people before before we close up this this segment? Well, Jordan, obviously I'm here because I have a great deal of respect for the work you've done over the last few years. <clears throat> and I particularly admire the way you have reached uh, a wide international audience, particularly uh, an audience of younger men, uh, and tried to remind them of the enduring virtues uh, you have tried to give them uh, through uh, your own insights and your own experience, uh, something to live for and some ways of actually grasping uh, those, uh, those essential truths. And look, um, <clears throat> I just think that... Uh, uh, Countries like Australia, and and look, I, I would extend this to the Anglosphere in particular, and I suppose to the Western world more generally, we have achieved so much, um, and largely through the influence um, of uh, the Anglo-American ascendancy, the whole world in 2020 <clears throat> it was more prosperous, it was more safe, it was more free than it ever before than ever before in human history. And rather than um, despise uh, and reject the values that created that, uh, we should cherish and admire them. Uh, and yes, uh, to do our best to renew them and take them forward, uh, because uh, I want, the future to be at least as good as the recent past, uh, and yet things look much more ominous now than at any time since the early 1940s. And uh, I, I don't think we're going to fix it um, by surrender, uh, whether it's economic surrender, uh, whether it's military surrender, whether it's cultural and civilizational surrender. Um, surrender is not the way. Um, a, a decent and self-confident um, approach is is going to be best for everyone. Well, hopefully, hopefully that that hopefully that's something that we can outline in more detail with this Alliance for Responsible Citizenship. You know, and what 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 was, what was it that Churchill said at the beginning of his of his uh, of his histories of the Second World War? Um, in defeat, defiance, in war, resolution in peace, goodwill, and in victory, magnanimity. I mean, something like that is what we need today. Yeah, yeah. Well, it would be lovely. What we're hoping to do is to help inspire a vision for the future that draws on the wisdom of the past with respect for the past, with the kind of respect for the past that you described developing, you know, over the course of your life, that people can ally themselves with voluntarily, that will provide them with hope, and that will offer a respite from unnecessary anxiety, and and with tremendous emphasis on the voluntary element. Right? We we don't want to produce a vision that would rely on compulsion, force, and fear to implement, but that would be invitational instead. And I don't think that that's a pipe dream. I think that that's actually what everyone who has any sense and who thinks about it for any length of time would want. And so I'll see you in London, I believe, at the end of October. And so that should be extraordinarily interesting. And we certainly appreciate your participation. I'm looking forward to it, Jordan. Thank you. 
All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you to everyone watching and listening on the YouTube side um, uh, for your time and attention and to the Daily Wire Plus crew for facilitating this conversation. And uh, uh, thank you again, Mr. Abbott, for your your time and your insight. And that's all much appreciated. We, we've had a lot of uh, positive response in relationship to the ARC on the Australian side. And so that's been very heartening. And um, we're hoping that that'll produce all sorts of positive things in the future. So thank you very much, sir. Very good talking to you today. Thank you.